Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank the members for, who have spoken for their support of the bill. Mr. Morali and Mr. D'Souza inquired about the circumstances under which remedial measures may be imposed on a lawyer and what kind of remedial measures can be imposed. The introduction of remedial measures under the disciplinary framework for lawyers allows the Law Society Council to have a wide range of measures to deal with less serious disciplinary matters. These remedial measures can be imposed in addition to or in lieu of the current options which are available. Such remedial measures may involve training, counselling and other means of rehabilitation. These provide for a more nuanced, tailored and effective means to address the root causes of certain types of misconduct as well as reduce recidivism. Such remedial measures will be set out in subsidiary legislation. Mr. Morali also asked why the proposed amendments do not provide for the Court of Three Judges to impose remedial measures unlike the Law Society Council or the Disciplinary Tribunal. The answer is that the system design is such that by the time it comes before the Court of Three Judges, it means the case has gone well beyond remedial measures. The Court of Three Judges is disciplinary in nature, not in remedial. By the time a complaint involving misconduct by a lawyer comes before the Court of Three Judges, three stages in the disciplinary review process would have been completed. First, a review committee would have decided that the complaint is of such substance that it must be referred to an inquiry committee. Second, the inquiry committee would already have found that a case of misconduct has been made out against the lawyer and it would have taken the view that the complaint must be referred to a disciplinary tribunal. Third, the disciplinary tribunal would have determined that cause of sufficient gravity for disciplinary action exists such that the matter has to be referred to the court of three judges. As you can see, it is a rigorous process and one in which less serious infractions capable of remediation are weeded out early and dealt with. Each step of the process deals with increasing levels of severity of lapses or infractions. The complaints which come before the Court of Three Judges are therefore the ones that involve egregious cases of misconduct for which the remedial measures are not sufficient or appropriate. But that said, as pointed out by Mr. Murali, that does, not that does not foreclose the Court of Three Judges from imposing requirements on legal practitioners such as undertakings to the Court which may mirror obligations imposed through remedial measures. We do not condone bad behaviour by lawyers and we wish to send a message that errant lawyers will not, will be, will not be let off lightly for serious cases of misconduct. This brings me to Mr. Lewis Ng's and Mr. D'Souza's point on the correlation between the amendments to Section 88.1, read with Section 88.3, and the opportunity to be heard under the latter provision. As mentioned, the disciplinary process for lawyers is multi-tiered. A lawyer who is the subject of a complaint may have reasonable opportunity to be heard by the inquiry committee. After counsel has considered the report of the inquiry committee, it can determine that no formal investigation is required and no penalty be imposed on the lawyer. Counsel can also determine that there should be a formal investigation by the disciplinary tribunal. What Section 88 deals with is the intermediate situation where it has been determined by the counsel that some wrongdoing has occurred but no formal investigation is needed. So it doesn't need to be referred to the DC. With the amendments, this now allows for two options under Section 88. First, the existing option for imposing a warning, reprimand or penalty continues to apply. These sanctions are entered as adverse orders against the lawyer's name on the roll. Second, the new remedial measures which are rehabilitative in nature can also be considered. As mentioned, these remedial measures may include counselling and training for the lawyer. In line with the nature of the remedial measures which are not punitive and consistent with the objective of rehabilitating the lawyer, these are not entered against the name of the lawyer on the roll. In the event counsel wishes to impose the former 
meaning the reprimand or the, the penalty, the lawyer is always offered an opportunity to be heard. If having heard his explanations, counsel remains of the view that those sanctions continue to be appropriate, those sanctions will be applied. This is how it's currently done, and therefore there's no substantive change to the operations of Section 88.1. Where the lawyer has been heard by counsel, and counsel agrees that a warning, reprimand, or penalty is not appropriate, counsel may, pursuant to the new Section 88.1a, impose a remedial measure that does not go onto the lawyer's disciplinary records. And in that situation, he would already have been heard in the first instance. So this addresses both Mr. Lewis uh, Ng's points as well. Mr. Morali asked whether there are sufficient monies in the compensation fund. The compensation fund was first established in 1962 and is maintained and administered by the Law Society. Where it has been proven to the satisfaction of counsel that a person has sustained loss as a result of dishonesty by a lawyer, the Law Society may, if the counsel thinks fit, make a grant to that person out of the compensation fund for the purpose of relieving or mitigating that loss. All practicing lawyers have to make an annual contribution of $100 to the compensation fund, bringing the total annual contribution to about $500,000. For the financial year ending 31st March 2017, the balance in the compensation fund amounted to $13 million. Over the past six years, about 500,000 was paid out from the compensation fund. As such, there are sufficient monies in the compensation fund to meet the purposes of the fund. Let me now address the amendment relating to the payment of penalties for failure to vote to the Law Society rather than the compensation fund. Currently, where members fail to vote at council elections, they pay a penalty of $500, which is credited to the compensation fund. The Law Society's position is that the failure to vote at council elections has no nexus with professional misconduct, but rather pertains to the administration of the Law Society or its governance. As such, penalty sums should be credited to the Law Society instead of the compensation fund. This will allow the Law Society to use the monies in a manner that advances the public interest. Second, as the member has highlighted, allowing the penalty sum to be credited to the Law Society also aligns with the current crediting of penalties to the Law Society under Section 95 of the Act, where the Council has ordered a lawyer to pay a penalty. Ms. Morali asked about the expected amount of monies generated from penalties for failing to vote given that the Law Society has moved to electronic voting for its council elections recently. The average penalty collected prior to the implementation of online voting was about $28,000. Since the implementation of online voting in October 2016, the amount of penalty sums collected has decreased significantly. For the period April 2017 to January 2018, the penalty sums collected decreased to $13,500. Hence, the amount in question is not large. Mr. Christopher de Souza asked about the operation and thinking behind Clause 20 of the bill, which relates to the requirement for prescribed classes of solicitors who practice or intend to practice in a prescribed area of law to make a declaration when applying for a practicing certificate. As mentioned, this amendment puts into effect the recommendation of the Study Committee on Professional Standards and Etiquette in Court under the auspices of the Singapore Academy of Law's Professional Affairs Committee, which looked into issues of professional standards and court etiquette for the bar. One of the study committee's recommendations was for the Law Society to introduce an online test to remind members of their professional obligations as counsel and decorum and etiquette in court. The Law Society's intention is to prescribe that solicitors who practice in the area of litigation will need to complete a short online test and declare that they have done the test before applying for or renewing their practicing certificates. This online test will be a self-assessment and self-learning tool to propagate good practices, as well as to reinforce and serve as a useful reminder of changes which are relevant to their practice area. For new entrants to the profession, and for those for whom litigation may not be a core practice area, 
they will benefit from having more guidance by way of this online test. The amendments in the bill also allow the Law Society Council to exempt a solicitor or a class of solicitors if it is satisfied that the solicitor or class of solicitors is already equipped with the knowledge and skills required for practice in that area of the law. Next, I'll deal with the unclaimed money fund. Mr. Morali asked why the proposed amendments do not require the Law Society to take reasonable efforts to return the money to the owners. The reason is because that should have been done by the solicitors as part and parcel of their duties even before they pay the money over to the unclaimed money fund. The Law Society's role is primarily that of a repository of the unclaimed monies, administration of the approved uses to which it can be put, and its other role is to make discretionary decisions on payments out to clients after expiration of the limitation period. Broadly summarising, the new Section 70K provides that a solicitor or Singapore law practice may apply to pay into the unclaimed money fund money which should, be, which should be paid to the client, but which they are unable to do so despite making such reasonable efforts as the law society may require. So in other words, the lawyer or the law firm has to make all reasonable efforts first uh, before they can pay money over to the fund. And as to what the reasonable efforts are, the subsidiary legislation will prescribe what the required reasonable efforts are, taking into account relevant circumstances previously mentioned. In turn, the Law Society may not approve a transfer unless it is satisfied that the prescribed reasonable efforts requirements have been satisfied. The burden of taking steps to return the money is rightly placed on the lawyers because they are the ones with the primary duty to return the money to the client and they are the ones who have the files and records and will therefore be in a better position to contact the clients. It would not be practical to expect the Law Society to make efforts to search for the owners of the money when their own lawyers have been unable to find them despite reasonable efforts. In any case, as I mentioned earlier, if the lawful owner of the money surfaces after the money has been transferred, they will still be able to apply to the Law Society for the transferred money to be returned to them. And this strikes a balance on what is fair on the lawyer, the client and the Law Society. To complement the framework, my ministry has also written to the Secretariat of the Professional Conduct Council to ask them to consider introducing in the legal professional, professional conduct rules an express duty for lawyers to take reasonable efforts to return client money without undue delay once the money is no longer required for the purpose for which they are held. If implemented, such a duty may reduce the number of new cases of unclaimed client money being accumulated. Finally, I would like to reassure Mr. Morali that the new unclaimed money fund is not an additional source of income for the law society. Rather, the Act, as amended, expressly requires the money to be invested or used to fund pro bono services. The subsidiary legislation will also prescribe in greater detail how the money in the fund may be used, and in this regard, the Minister must also approve any subsidiary legislation which the Law Society Council makes for the purposes of the framework. This will serve as an additional check. Thus, I think it would be fair to say that the people who will benefit from the new unclaimed money fund will be the members of the public who are in need of and eligible for the Law Society's pro bono services. Separately, Ms. Rohayu had inquired about the intent of the new Section 70K4. To summarise, this section provides that no action to recover any transferred unclaimed client money may be brought after the expiry of six years from the date when the Law Society approves the transfer against, first, the solicitor or Singapore law practice that paid the transferred unclaimed client money into the unclaimed money fund, or, second, any solicitor or Singapore law practice that held the money on account of a client at any time before that money was paid into the fund. The intent of the provision is to set a limitation period of six years against all actions that may be brought against any lawyer or law practice who has ever held the unclaimed client money previously. The provision distinguishes between A, 
the lawyer who transferred the unclaimed client money into the unclaimed money fund, and b, any lawyer who may have held the money previously to account, to account for the possibility that some unclaimed client money may have been passed from one retiring lawyer to another practicing lawyer previously. Such retired lawyers will therefore also have the clarity and certainty arising from the limitation period too. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker.